Okay, we're going to move on with our conversation around air freight consolidations to talk about the key document that kind of runs the entire process, the House Airway Bill. We'll start by pointing out that the image on the right is, yes, an airway bill. We're going to show a blown up version in upcoming slides, so don't worry about the visibility factor on these initial slides. Within an air import consolidation, each U.S. importer's shipment is identified by a document that the forwarder prepares known as a House Airway Bill, H-A-W-B, very similar to the House Ocean Bill of Lading that we saw in our module on ocean freight. Second bullet, the key to the air import documentation process, House Bills capture vital information on the shipper, the vendor overseas, the consignee, the U.S. importer, characteristics of the transaction, and the forwarder, the company that's moving the freight. As a trade tip, we'll use an analogy. An air weigh bill for a cargo shipment can be considered to be analogous to a passenger's ticket on a flight. They are very similar because the ticket or the information behind the ticket captures all the details about the passenger. Same thing with a house airway bill, as we'll see in upcoming slides. The house bill as it's called, the House Airway Bill shows the details of each importer's shipment, including the following. There has to be a unique House Airway Bill number that is issued sequentially by the freight forwarder. There's also what's called a Master Airway Bill, an MAWB. That's a document that governs the entire consolidation. We'll talk more about that in greater detail in just a bit. The agent's IATA code which is the link to that accreditation that we spoke so much about previously. Shipper and consignee information. The shipper is the supplier at origin. The consignee typically, almost always, is the U.S. importer. Complete details there. And by the way, just as an impromptu trade tip, full addresses must be used. No P.O. boxes allowed, either for the shipper or the consignee. That's post 9-11 security stuff but something to point out. We need our origin and destination airports, also any connecting airports or flights, and then the carrier, the actual airline, and the flight number or numbers if, as we said a moment ago, there are any connections to be made. All of this has to appear on the airway bill, which we'll be showing in a larger format in just a minute. Continuing on with the content of a house airway bill, any special instructions that goes in the middle of the body of the airway bill pieces and weight number of cartons and the total weight something we haven't talked about yet but will do so in great detail actual versus chargeable weight that dense versus voluminous cargo calculation just like we saw for LCL and ocean freight what is the currency for the charges what are those charges and are they prepaid or collect this is very much related to the Incoterms rule that we've talked ourselves blue in the face about. And any ancillary charges, additional charges above and beyond the base air freight rate. We'll see more on that too. And then as a trade tip, as if we haven't said it enough, the division of charges on an airway bill between the U.S. importer and overseas vendor is driven by the Incoterms rule. Who pays the inland freight from the origin factory to the airport? Who pays any consolidation fees by the freight forwarder? Who pays the main mode of air freight transport? Who pays for delivery at destination? The answer to that question depends on the Incoterms rule. We'll see how charges are divided when we take a closer look at a house airway bill, which is exactly what we're going to do right now. This is a sample house bill. We can see on the left, each field in the bill is numbered and the corresponding information requirement on the right-hand side. Before we start, it will become clear that the information provided that goes on a house bill is a combination of information provided by the shipper, the overseas vendor, certainly the freight forwarder, and also the U.S. importer, especially if that U.S. importer controls the cargo. Let's see what we mean. Field number one, that's the shipper's name and full address. That is the information coming from the supplier at origin. Number two, consignee's name and address. Consignee, just another name for the U.S. importer of record. Who's the buyer 
in the United States. Who's the importer? Field three. As we have said previously, every airport around the world has a three-letter uppercase code. That is where the code for the origin airport goes, whatever airport the freight is flying out of at origin. Four, three-letter code of the destination airport, JFK, LAX, MIA for Miami, ORD for Chicago, on and on and on, whatever the destination airport is. Declared value for carriage option doesn't have to be filled out, but could be the value of the goods. Shipment value for customs purposes, that's field six. Field seven is handling information. That's the area where any special instructions that we spoke of previously can be put in. We actually have a real world example of what some of that information might be. Stand by for that. Getting into the details of the shipment, field eight, the number of pieces. How many cartons are we talking about? The gross weight, which is the actual weight of the cargo, doesn't include the tear weight of any pallets or containers, ULDs, etc. Field 10, in kilos, because our airway bills are coming in from overseas, and all other countries besides the US use the metric system, that's going to be in kilos. Number 11, the chargeable weight. That's the actual or the dimensional weight, whichever is greater. In upcoming sections, we're going to do that whole actual versus volume weight calculation. That's where the chargeable weight goes. What's the rate? That goes in field 12. There's a couple of fields for the master airway bill. We'll skip that for now and come back to it later when we talk about the master airway bill. 14, nature and quantity of goods. It's a description of the goods that have to be consistent with the description on the commercial invoice, the packing list. Remember, we talked about that in previous sections incessantly. The same applies here for air freight. 15, signature of shipper or agent. That's the freight forwarder that's going to sign that. The date, the time, the place, and that pretty much wraps up the information that's required on a house airway bill. Let's summarize. As a U.S. importer that controls the freight, we're going to have to provide a fair amount of that information, albeit through our vendor overseas and how we instruct them to tell the forwarder at origin how to prepare a house airway bill. Everybody's involved. The overseas vendor, the freight forwarder, and the U.S. importer. One thing we do want to point out before moving on is in the lower left-hand corner of the house bill. This is where the charges are listed and divided as either prepaid or collect. This is where the expression of the chosen Inco terms rule comes into play. We've said it way too many times that the division of charges depends on the Inco terms rule. If the vendor, for example, is paying certain charges, they will show up on the prepaid side of the column. In our examples, where we already said that the importer controls the freight, that means that most of the charges are going to show up on the right-hand side. The total air freight charge and any additional charges as well. That will be freight collect to us as the U.S. importer. All of the other information, very, very important. Needless to say, from a financial perspective, we as the importer need to know that the charges are correct and that they are correctly applied. Who is paying for what? Let's wrap up this section with a talk on the additional functions of the House Airway Bill. Like any bill of lading, the House Bill serves several shipping and customs related functions. It's a contract for carriage, number one, just like an ocean bill of lading, just like a truck bill of lading. The terms under which a carrier will move the freight. More on that in just a bit. It's an evidence of receipt of goods, especially when a forwarder tenders cargo to an airline. It's a receipt. It's also a freight bill because as we spoke of just a minute ago, the charges are broken out by prepaid and collect in the lower left-hand side. And of equal importance, the airway bill serves as a vital component of the customs clearance documentation. We've said it over and over. To do a customs clearance in the U.S., the minimum requirement, bill of lading, in this case, a house airway bill, commercial invoice, packing list. Can't do the customs clearance without that document, or at least the contents from that document. Trade tip, and we'll close out this section here. The conditions of contract for carriage 
serve as the terms and conditions for the carrier and are found on the reverse side of every airway bill. We're going to look at the reverse side of an airway bill in the upcoming section. Very exciting stuff. Do come back quickly.